More than a dozen historically black colleges and universities faced another round of bomb threats. We can easily fit this into a recurring theme of the white backlash. Six persons of interest in this matter. They're all juveniles, they're all very tech savvy. Tech savvy juveniles. Black youth never get these qualifiers. HBCUs are leading the way in terms of what a truly democratic, multiracial, multicultural society looks like. Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Well. The FBI is calling it a high-priority investigation involving more than 20 officers across the country and seeking racially motivated violent extremists who are targeting historically black colleges and universities in an ongoing way. The news broke in early February that nearly 20 so-called HBCUs had received bomb threats in just the first two days of Black History Month. But it didn't stop there. Howard University was threatened again on Valentine's Day, February 14th. And that university has endured at least four threats in just the past two months. As the second gentleman discovered when he visited a school in Washington, D.C., the threats are now spreading, it seems, to high schools. It's a high-priority investigation, but it has not been getting high-priority commercial media attention, at least not in comparison to some other stories we could mention. It is yet another assault on civil rights and education. For more, we turn, as we do every month, to our colleagues at URL Media to fill out the story. Mitra Kalita can't join us today. Because of a loss in her family, we send our condolences. Sarah Lomax Reese is joining me now. Sarah and Mitra are the co-founders of URL Media, a network of black and brown owned and operated media platforms across the country. Sarah Lomax Reese heads up WURD FM Talk Radio in Philadelphia, and they've been covering this story very closely. Thanks, Laura. It's so great to be with uh, you and your audience uh, to for our monthly URL roundtable, Meet the BIPOC Press. Uh, this story is incredibly important, and uh, we're looking forward to diving in with two incredible guests. Today, we have uh, Brother Shamari, who is a host on WURD in Philadelphia. He hosts a weekly show called Groundings, Evolutions, and Elevations. And we also have uh, Krista Johnson, who is a professor at uh, Howard University, one of those HBCUs who's been affected by the bomb threats. She is also the director of the Center for African Studies at Howard. So welcome, Brother Shamari and Krista Johnson. Thanks for being with us. Having you. Thank you for having us. So Krista, I want to start with you because um, you're right there in the, you know, on the ground at Howard, interfacing with students, faculty, staff um, that have experienced these bomb threats. Tell us what the environment is like. What is the mood? How are people coping with this, um, with these, these threats? You know, we have made real strong efforts this academic year to try and return the campus to normal, to have in-person classes, and to, you know, try and have a campus environment which was as normal as possible, given the, the times in which we're, we're living. And so this has been a real serious disruption, because, I mean, it seems like almost every week, but certainly very frequently, we have an app that we all use called Bison Safe, which gives us real-time alerts in terms of what's going on on campus. And it seems as though every week there's, you know, a bomb threat or, you know, uh, shelter in place uh, alert that, that comes up over that. So it, I, I think, you know, speaking to my students in my class and then uh, colleagues, it's unsettling. It's very unsettling. Um, I know our university and our administration has, you know, taken steps to, to really try and not normalize this. I mean, I think, I think there's not a, um, a great amount of fear, you know, around campus. I don't think people are now walking around campus so much more fearful, but it's, it takes, I think, more of a mental toll in many ways because people recognize that, that, you know, we feel like we're under attack, right? Or that there's, you know, something could happen at any time. And, and I want to go to you, Shamari, because I know that you're a graduate of Morehouse um, College in Atlanta, and um, we're situated here in the, the Philadelphia area, and we have 
uh, several HBCUs in, in this region, Lincoln, Cheney, Delaware State. Um, to, my, uh, to my knowledge, Lincoln and Cheney haven't been affected by the bomb threats, but Delaware State has. And I just wanna get your sense on having gone to an HBCU and observing this and being um, you know, someone who hosts a show, what are you what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Um, how are you processing this? Well, again, yeah, I'm a graduate of Morehouse and I also did a year at Howard uh, for grad school. Um, I was at Howard actually uh, with the student admin takeover back in 89. So, you know, having been on that campus, seeing uh, National Guard troops and helicopters circling, uh, this is not a lightweight thing. Uh, this this idea of a bomb threat, we know uh, of the bombing of the four little girls in Alabama. So, you know, recent church uh, shootings. So, so this idea of the perpetuation of fear is a big deal. And so that's one lens of looking at it. But then also I'm just intrigued by the, the, the way that the idea of youthfulness and juveniles gets perpetuated as a cloak of potential innocence or buffering culpability for white youth. And at the same time, being in Philly, watching how black youth are villainized for some of the exploits that they do. And so how this juvenile youth narrative gets employed or deployed, depending on which color you are, is probably one of the most intriguing aspects of this for me, as well as I don't think until now we've appreciated which H what HBCUs are, how unique they are, as a phenomena, as an institution in and of themselves, and what their contribution to Black history has been. And I think that this gives us an opportunity to really delve deep into that. Why, why something like an HBCU would be a particular target in these kind of, um, um, whether you want to call it white backlash or whatever you want to call it. So, so that's what's on my mind regarding this based on where I'm positioned. Yeah, I think that's so that's so powerful, the juxtaposition um, between how white youth and, and black youth are, are portrayed in the media and, and viewed in society. And, and one of the phrases, because I think language is so powerful, particularly as we report and uh, consume media, this, this idea that these young people or whoever are making these terroristic threats are being um, described as tech savvy juveniles. Now, police tell us that they have some tech savvy juveniles as persons of interest. So it's almost like a backhanded compliment where it's exactly. like, you know, these are these smart, savvy uh, people who are who are terrorizing black people. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking about this notion of how black people are portrayed in the media in such disparate ways from, from uh, white people. And I don't, I don't know if, if either one of you, Krista or Shamari, want to speak to how this whole issue is being covered and is it getting enough attention, not just because the way it's being framed, but just in general. This is not a one-off event. I mean, as I think we'll you know probably get on, there's an entire history, you know, kind of behind uh, bomb threats, behind arson attacks, um, and even state-sponsored and state, you know, violence on HBCU campuses, right? So it's it's kind of a larger societal thing, and so it's a kind of as you said, you know, kind of throw this off as though be as being just these tech sa savvy youth is really I think missing, you know, kind of the larger underlying issues which. Um, which have persisted for for quite 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 a while. Yeah, I, I know across my news feed, uh, just I, I guess about a, a day ago, there were three more campuses in North Carolina and South Carolina. I think uh, Fayetteville State, Claflin, and Winston Salem. So this is not something that went away with this, you know, targeting a, or, or identification of the six tech savvy juveniles. And I'm amazed at how black youth never get these qualifiers, right? You know, it's, it, it's, it, I, I, I think for me, that's a very interesting phenomenon that we really need to pay attention to, particularly as the Olympics are going on and somehow the 15 year old Russian skater is exonerated from culpability because she's 15. At the same time that we just endured the Kyle Rittenhouse trial and somehow his youthfulness exonerated him from some egregious actions. 
And yet again, I can't speak for the rest of the country, but I'm in Philadelphia. I'm watching this narrative about the four girls who attacked you know, the young people on the, on the subway. I'm watching how young people who are Black are villainized in their youthfulness in a very particular way. And that, to me, is really one of the, the aspects of, of, of this that I think we need to pay attention to. And, and, and no, it's not being covered at the level that it warrants. I mean, you're talking about close to 20 and, and evolving institutions that have received bomb threats. And I, I, you know, we can recall bomb threats shutting down major places. We can, you know, bomb threats open up a response from the FBI, from, from the police, from different ways. And I think we need to be careful about that as well. I think that that's a thing we need to talk about. What, what, does, what, what are the potentialities of this if it's handled incorrectly for the Black people that are supposed to be protected? Because we also pay a price when... The, the, the forces of protection come into our spaces, somehow we also become victims in, in our own protection as well. I mean, it's not unconnected that, you know, in the past several years where many universities have seen a significant decline in their enrollment, HBCUs across the board have seen a significant increase in their enrollment, right? And I think, you know, that's not simply, I mean, and we can talk about the, you know, the ways in which that um, reflects, I don't know if it's an awakening, but, you know, kind of more recognition on the part of the African-American community that, that, that we can do as better, and in fact, we can we can probably do better at HBCUs because they're more nurturing, et cetera, et cetera, than at you know these other institutions. But it also, I think, goes very much to the heart of um, you know higher education, and I think the future of higher education. I mean, I'll just give Howard as an example. I, I mean, I think people have a, a wrong impression of HBCUs as being the kind of HBCUs of old. Howard is one of the most extremely diverse campuses on in the country. Uh, you would think, I mean, I think most people probably think it's 95% black. No, in fact, our student body is comprised of, um, it's about 67% black and non-Hispanic, but we also have 16% uh, white, we have 11% Asian, and six and a half percent Hispanic, and then four and a half percent multiple races. I say that to say, I think HBCUs are really kind of leading the way in terms of what a truly dem a democratic, multiracial, multicultural society looks like, right? And I think that's very frightening and very intimidating for what has historically been a white world order that has, has embraced racial hierarchy. If, if we understand our history, we can easily fit this into a recurring theme of the white backlash. It always happens in the face of some perceived moment of black progress. So it, it, it challenges me to be surprised given that everybody should understand that after Barack Obama, it was predicted that there was going to be a significant white backlash to that perceived accomplishment. That's part of the historical, uh, Langston Hughes talks about it in poetry. Like, so, I, I think we should have been more proactive about preparing as Black people for the backlash we knew was coming. We wish we had been better prepared for this kind of retrenchment that was totally predictable. My obviously predictable question is, what would we as a, a nation of people or as a group of people committed to a multiracial project in this country, what would we have done? And what are the people that you know calling for in this moment, because I think I detected a little concern about leaving this in the hands of police and FBI. Krista? I would say, yeah, look at HBCU campuses now. I mean, the the, the kinds of programming that we're doing, um, the kinds of bridge building that we're creating. I mean, I can just give you one example. We're, we're creating a new social justice certificate program um, at Howard University, which is again, really, I think changing the, uh, the perceptions and the, the, the understandings of what higher education is about. That, that certificate program is going to not only be uh, cater towards um, obviously college students, but also community members, even prisoners and whatnot. And is actually also going to rely on those constituencies and communities to 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 develop the curriculum around that as well. So we're we're and that's just one example, but I can think of a number of other examples where there's really innovative, I think, in very new and dynamic ways of you know kind of reorganizing our societies. We have in the medical school as well. We have the professor actually who himself was incarcerated as a young 
youth and has now gone on to, to become a faculty member. But he too is now initiating a program which is specifically for prison, you know, pri the prison population. So really rethinking, I mean, it re requires a significant, I think, rethinking of really, I think, the bases of a lot of, uh, of what we're taught, what we teach, um, and what we you know, think as a society. Both you, Shamari, and you, Krista, um, have scholarship in kind of the, the African diaspora. You're, you're looking at this world, not just as within the, the United States um, Black experience, but really looking at like a Pan-African um, context. And I wanted to see if each of you could give us a sense of where this issue, the, the, the bomb threats and the, um, you know, the, the terroristic um, approaches that are happening against HBCUs and other Black institutions in this moment, where does the, the, the African diaspora and other countries, um, Black countries, where does it fit into this conversation and, and how do we make those connections so that there is more fortification across, um, you know, across the, the, the world as opposed to us just dealing with this in, a, in an American context? And, and I, you know, it's interesting, I, I think that prior to 2020 and COVID uh, back in 2019 and, and around that time, there was Black HBCU sponsored uh, a major conversation about Africa, the diaspora, and what they were calling the sixth region. I mean, Delaware State locally, but many Black HBCUs were the, the places, again, where significant conversation interaction around uh, us as the African diaspora and how we're mutually supportive, how you bring the sixth region, which would be uh, Africans living outside of the continent, right? into a, a unified kind of economic, social, political ideation. That was happening on HBCUs, you know, and, and HBCUs in many ways are probably one of the most still existing significant conduits for this diaspora connection. Howard has, you know, a, a program in African studies, African-American studies. Howard is a very diasporic campus. But again, as I said earlier, HBCUs, we didn't go back historically with, 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 with uh, Kwame Nkrumah being educated at Lincoln University, uh, Namde Azikwe, who became the first president of Nigeria at Lincoln University, many other African luminaries uh, exchanging educational space to build the diaspora, to build what we call global Pan-Africanism. And so, I, I don't think that that's a lightweight consideration, again, in, in these dynamics, because you're disrupting the peace, you're disrupting the, 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 the security in spaces that have been producing a lot of the either local domestic civil rights energy that we have. Even up through now, when you go back to the Trayvon Martin reactions, Black Lives Matter, HBCUs have been seminal places for that energy to come from. When you, when you talk about critical race theory, again, you're talking about the, not, not just HBCUs as a space that controls a significant amount of land in the city, many cities that are under the duress of gentrification. I, I don't know how much that plays into the matter as well, but then you also have these ideological spaces that are creating local pushes for autonomy, but then also linking it to the African diaspora. I don't know that it's accidental, and I don't know that that's what the six tech savvy white youth were thinking about, but I think in a larger narrative of, of the other dynamics that are going on in the United States and the globe, I think that that plays a factor. Yeah, I, I would just add that, I mean, historically HBCUs, as Brother Shamari said, had those connections with Africa. And I think that it's important to recognize that, again, I mean, I talk about the diversity of Howard's campus now, but if you go back to the 1930s, you know, 40s, 50s, Howard had one of the most international campuses, you know, in, in, the, in the country as well. And, and there was there were concerted efforts to ensure that those kinds of ties that were being established on HBCU campuses did not continue. And so 
we were given, for example, there was kind of a bit of a trade-off. We were given, for example, Afro-American studies, you know, departments all over the place, but the, the, the quid pro quo was, but you only focus on your own issues. You know, don't link those to, you know, struggles and causes that go beyond that. And so I think you had a moment, certainly after the civil rights movement, where there was, I think, maybe more of an inward, you know, looking turn. But what I'm seeing now, again, is this, you know, HBCUs are embracing the international. They are global institutions. And they're, re they're recognizing that. As uh, Brother Shamari said at Howard, just to toot our own horn in Center for African Studies, we teach uh, seven African languages and we lead the country in the student enrollment in African languages. Over 800 Howard students last year studied an African language. But it also reflects the diversity and the kind of different makeup of our student body. And in fact, the African American, uh, uh, the African -American demographics. So, 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 I mean, I think what you're seeing is a lot more first and second generation Africans who have much closer ties and links to uh, the continent. And they're bringing those in and saying, hey, we can you know, build on these. So I think there's lots of real opportunity there. And I would just all, also want to add that that dynamic is historical to HBCUs. When you think about Booker T. Washington, you know, we think about what he, he, he was represented as locally, but he, he was a, a large proponent against colonialism that was happening all across the African continent and actually engaged in many ways with the training around agriculture and science and, and, and other things um, in, in particular places. So this, this kind of, you know, Marcus Garvey from Jamaica came to America because he was inspired by the teachings at Tuskegee and Booker T. Washington. So this idea of African educate black educational spaces always having a diasporic connection is historical as well as contemporary. Well, this is such a powerful conversation, and we covered so much, uh, so much territory in this this short snapshot and I hope that we can revisit this at some point because there's obviously we, we started talking about uh, the bomb threats against HBCUs but there's a much bigger conversation about the the power and the the centering of black intelligentsia at historically black colleges and universities so thank you so much brother Shamari and Krista Johnson for this uh, riveting conversation and hopefully we can do it again Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Sarah, thank you for this rich conversation. As you said, HBCUs clearly deserve more attention in our media, especially under attack, but it seems to me all the time. Um, what are you seeing in the black press and the, and the of color press, the BIPOC press that is different about how this story is being covered? And are you seeing more complexity around this question of what should be done? I think all of these issues are, are critical. Um, I think that like uh, the, the press writ large, we are trying to stay on top of the, the black press in particular is trying to stay on top of an ongoing onslaught of racist um, threats and, and just a, an, an elevated level of all of these, uh, whether it's police brutality or um, you know, criminal justice, uh, inequities, healthcare disparities. So this bomb threat issue is like, it's it's one of, of a long line of urgent topics that we're all trying to prioritize. And so it's almost like whack-a-mole. And I think that, that there's a real issue of fatigue, you know, for our reporters, for our hosts, for the, the, the folks on the front lines in the black press who are covering these issues day in and day out, because a lot of times it's very personal. We might have children at these HBCUs. We are graduates at these eight of these HBCUs. And so it's very, we might be teaching at these HBCUs. So it's very, very close and personal. And so, you know, we're balancing a lot of different things. I think, you know, short answer, I think we need to do more. We need to, um, I know at Word, we're about to convene a, a roundtable of HBCU presidents to really dig into what this is all about. But at the end of the day, we have to also find an answer. We've, we've got to have um, you know, law enforcement. We've got to have the legislature. We've got to have a lot of different answers to address this because it's very real. It's very disruptive. It's, it's a drain on our mental and emotional well-being. 
And but it's 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 very very serious, and I think that it needs to be bumped up in terms of uh, priorities. Well, we're going to do everything we can to bump it up um, as in, in our community and with the audience that we can reach. And, and I can only hope that we're going to see some action at the at the government level, state and, and, and federal, um, taking action. But I, I will say that the future of the HBCUs seems bright to me in this moment, given what we're hearing about increased enrollment and, and new funding and new visibility. So maybe this time this story can be treated differently, but we have to work at it. Thank you both. Um, I should say you and Mitra, because Mitra's here in spirit. Yes. Um, um, but thank you, Sarah, and everybody that you brought to our Meet the BIPOC Media Roundtable today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Laura.